all in all, I've learned that sharing really is caring. That is good for, for the environment, it's good for me, it's good for Pachamama. And that caring is love, love and happiness. Uh, that's what I've learned. You find your tribe, you find your family. I've learned that what I have control is only about myself and my surroundings. And I've learned that by joining others with similar values, the inner divine light shines bigger, that together we can live by example with, with growth, sharing, learning, mirroring, service, intimacy, and a deeper knowing of others that ultimately leads to a deeper knowing of myself. Hello and a very warm welcome to Ashwa Rainbow Dragon. I am here with you today to have a conversation, a very special conversation about intentional communities. So I'm very excited to find out what this is all about and also what and in how far it might add to universal peace and cosmic harmony. So Ashwa Rainbow Dragon, would you mind to share something about you? You are very, very experienced when it comes to communities and to living together, not just with family or spouses or other significant people, but really with people from all kinds of life. Maybe you can tell me something about you and all your rich experience. Sure. Thank you so much for having me once again, Marlene and Katarina. And before we proceed, I wanted to acknowledge first uh, the land that we're in and actually light a candle and to call upon the different elements, call upon the, the earth and the salamanders, and call upon the sylphides and the nymphs of the water and call upon the, the ethers, water, air, fire, ethers all of them together, and to also give thanks to the land and to the ancestors and all the people who have lived before us, all our lineages, to guide us from our hearts with all the sacredness that so much work has been done before in so many levels for us to be here today. I wanted to acknowledge them, to give thanks, and to be grateful for you having me here today. Thank you. So uh, a little bit of my background in terms of communities. Uh, ever since I was a teenager, I found out about the world of communities and I felt like a kid in a candy store. And I realized, wow, people actually live together like this, sharing and cooperating. And that led me to be involved with different organizations such as the FEC, the Federation of Egalitarian Communities, the FIC, which is now the foundation of intentional communities, the Global Eco Village Network. At that time, the founders, because it wasn't even created back then when I got involved with the communal movement. Together, some of these organizations hold more than 20,000 communities worldwide, and it keeps on growing. Got involved with a communities magazine, uh, got involved with the Twin Oaks Communities Conference. And so I have a background in that sense, besides my formal background in, in business. I have a background uh, creating grassroots organizations with foundations, uh, with co-ops. And I've been traveling a bit. So I've lived in four different continents and uh, visited more than 100 communities worldwide. I lost track after 120. I've also co-founded some communities, for example, Visionarios, Ecovinos, Chirusco, Casa de Pandora, Blue Giants. I also, I'm also the co-founder of uh, UEVN, which is the Utopian Eco-Village Network, and AICA, the Alliance of Intentional Communities of Australia. Also, with a group of people, uh, we co-founded the first seed festival in Adelaide, Australia, and also the South Australian Damanhurian Esoteric School of Meditation. So that's a little bit about, about the background. Some of my passions and hobbies related to that is that I do believe that we are here caretakers and guardians of, of Pachamama, that we should be the true custodians of the land, that she should not be speculated, bought or, or sold, and that we should be living in harmony with, with her and everything, all the abundance that she gives us. 
I enjoy and I've studied agroforestry, landscaping, shamanism, nutrition, cooking, food processing, gardening, and it's so passionate about self-sufficiency, sustainability, permaculture, and alternative forms of uh, construction methods and relationships. So throughout all this journey of communities through more than two decades, I've had to learn a little bit about everything that it takes to build a community from the ground up. So that's that's about it, about my background, a little bit of uh, bio that can relate to it and a little bit about our communities. Wow, great. Thank you so much. Now let's get to intentional communities and the question, what exactly is an intentional community? It's just not a not just a community it is right. an intentional community what can you tell us right about? so so the, the word intentional it's on purpose there because as you mentioned there are communities all kinds of communities i mean people gather together in different communes or communities worldwide but there is not an intentionality behind it people might buy a house in, in a neighborhood and that's a type of community but so when we talk about ic's intentional communities i would define it as a it's still not precise, a bit vague, because it's really an umbrella that covers many different types of uh, ways people live together. So basically, I would define it as a group of people who come together with with purpose, deliberately, and dedicated with, with a, a shared intent and a commitment to a mutual concern, to a mutual goal, to a mutual idea. And so that's how I would define an intentional community. In general, they either share land or housing or are even perhaps geographically close enough to have that continuous sense of fellowship, to be able to share projects and work cooperatively. And they basically create a shared lifestyle that is going to reflect back upon their shared core values. So that's how I define an IC, an intentional community. Great. Is there like a history of those? How far does it go back, those intentional communities? Can you tell us about that? Right. So basically, if, if we look at back in history, humans have been living here on Earth in communities, in tribes, in clans. So it goes all the way back to, to, to the beginning because uh, living alone meant uh, lower chances of survival. So we knew back then that we had to cooperate. We had to collaborate to increase our chances of survival. Can you imagine, you know, cavemen living by themselves, you know? So basically the history goes all the way back. But I could give you a quick rundown over the past 2,000 years about communities, if you'd like me to. That would be so, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go back to the beginning and the first and second century. We find, for example, the scenes which were communes based on morality, and they flourish around the Dead Sea area. Fast forward the third and fourth century, we have the first Christian monasterial communities. Moving fast forward during the fifth and sixth century, we had even in Greece, you know, Pythagoras, who founded Homokeion, which was a vegetarian community, which is kind of famous, based on intellectualism, mysticism, equality. And at the same time in India, we have the followers of Buddha who join also together to create ashrams and live in a spiritual manner. Fast forward all the way to the 11th and 12th century, there was the heretical Waldensen who founded many communities. And then you move forward to the 13th, 14th century, for example, with the Brethren, which were the free spirit, uh, creating secular communities in various parts of Europe. Then in the 14 to 1500s, we have the foundation of the Hutterians, which were another part of the Brethren uh, by the Anabaptist movement that established numerous spiritual communities, uh, such as the Hutterites or the Brotherhood Communists. That's when they came originally formed. Uh, the entire uh, German city of Münster back then became a complete, pretty much commune called the Anabaptist Commune. In the, ninth, in the 1540s, the Mennonites uh, actually started spreading their communes at that time. The 1600s, we have the diggers, which they pretty much were rebelling in the UK against aristocracy, and they were living in communal created land. In the late 1600s, we have the Amish, who then exported 
the communities uh, worldwide, specifically in South America. 1700s, we have the Hernots, which were a Moravian pietist commune established in the saxophone area. And they also moved to Australia, some of them, and they also founded some communes there. In the 1700s, we have the Shakers movement, which found communal groups that were pursuing spirituality, inventions, handicraft, and they were based on celibacy. 1700s, and towards the end of it, we have the, the, the Shaker commune Sabbath Day, which is also pretty well known, which is the, the oldest commune uh, group still in existence founded today. In the 1800s, we had, uh, for example, New Harmony, who was established in the U.S. By this time, a lot of people were migrating from Europe to the U.S. We also have the Brook Farm, which started in Massachusetts, and it was kind of a social experiment and was achieved through education and discussions and um, equality of participation. In 1848, Oneida, which is one of the oldest uh, communities in the U.S., was founded in New York, and it was based by complex marriages. In 1855, we have the Amana colonies. They were established in Iowa by German Protestants based on Christian beliefs. In 1874, we have Bonn Home, the Huterite commune that still remains in existence, was founded back then. At the turn of the century, we have Hull House, which was established in Chicago by Jane Adams. And then going to the 1900s, you know, the first kibbutzim in the 1910s was, were established by the Sea of Galilee. And many of them are still going strong today. And for those people who think that communes are only... Uh, made by hippies or people who didn't have uh, a lot of money, some of the kibbutzim that I've visited and met, they're millionaires because they have come up with great inventions. And so they have created very successful businesses. Moving fast forward, in 1913, Gold Farm was established uh, as a community based on the environment and the rehabilitation of emotionally disturbed people. So they were working with people who had... Uh, uh, were suffering of uh, certain limitations and disabilities. In the 1920s, the first Brotherhood community was founded uh, based on a Christian way of living together and is still in existence also as well. In the 1920s, a big breakthrough uh, following the communist revolution in Russia. Many of the communities uh, sprang up everywhere. Most of them were suppressed later, but they still sprang up and created this movement. In 1937, the first co-op house uh, started in Michigan, and it was kind of the forerunner of the inter-cooperative collective housing, which is a, a network of student co-op and co-housing. I had a great time in, in an arbor in Michigan, by the way. There's so many of them, and they function and work so wonderfully. In the 1940s, the Camp Hill movement, and it was based on therapeutic uh, communities. In 1948, the FIC, which is the Fellowship for Intentional Community, uh, originally named the, the, fe the Fellowship, but now it's called the Foundation of Intentional Communities, was founded. In 1950s, more than 20,000 communes were set up by the Communist uh, Party of China, but unfortunately, most of them are out of existence now. In 1958, we have the Yama Yishin life movement, which were basically agricultural communes mainly located in Japan. In the 1960s, the famous hippie movement found several thousands communities. Many of them were short-lived, but many of them have also survived. In 1964, for example, we have the first large community founded in France, and it was also focused on working with people with disabilities. In 1968, the Catholic Commune Movement of Integrierte Gemeinde was founded in Germany. In 1972, the co-housing movement was created in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen, Denmark, and is still in existence today. In 1992, the first eco-villages were founded in the U.S. and in Russia, and from there it has taken off with the support of the Global Eco-Village Network. So that's a little bit about the, the history, more or less, in the past 2,000 years of communes, not to bore you too much. Wow, that sounds so... Uh, like, we, we have heard about just 
a couple of them, I guess, because some have never come to our awareness these days. And it sounds to me as if there are also communities that might not be intentional, but people who group together. Can, can you tell me more about those who are not intentional and how, how do you say that they are not intentional communities? <laughs> So the the non-intentional part, like I was trying to define the the, commu the intentional community movement, there is intentionality behind it. And the ones who are not intentional, they just perhaps find uh, an area and people come together. Uh, perhaps it's because of, like you find in Africa and other uh, non-developed countries, people come together perhaps because there is water, there is accessibility, there is closeness to some sort of resource, but there's no actual intentionality shared be you know, through all of them. However, there are other types of, of groups of people coming together, such as eco-villages or cooperatives or senior communities or co-housing, as I mentioned, that was created in Denmark, or basically share housing, like students come in co-ops. There is also tiny houses, villages, indigenous villages, spiritual villages, religious villages, like ashrams, associations, land trusts, Uh, foundations and also transition towns, complete transition towns, villages. So these are other ways, right? So for example, with eco villages, uh, they're also included into the umbrella of an intentional community because they do share an intentionality. But not all communities are eco villages, but all eco villages are communities. So for example, the definition of an eco village is a bit more precise than just the definition I gave about communities. So an eco-village is basically an intentional, whether traditionally or, or urban community, consciously designed through locally owned participatory processes. So they include these four dimensions of sustainability, which are the social aspect, the cultural aspect, the ecological aspect, and the economical aspect. And they put them all together into a whole, a holistic system to regenerate a social and natural environment. So in this sense, eco-villages are a bit more precise than the term of communities. Okay, okay, got it. Perfect, yeah. So um, would you mind sharing some examples where you have been and where you would say that might be interesting for some or um, one of the other watching um yeah people here so yes like as i said you know there are thousands and thousands and thousands of communities worldwide uh they have been reaching peaks especially most recently do, during the last lockdown because people realize how nice it would be to live in the countryside and not be stuck in a flat in the city and have access to fresh air and nature growing their own food etc so usually throughout history a lot of the The, the history of communities have been closely linked to economical um, downturns and also spikes, as we can see through the 90s uh, with, with uh, the difficult economical situations that were in the world and as lately as the lockdown, but also during the depression in the 1920s or during the world wars or during famines in Europe where people immigrated to the Americas, for example. So some intentional communities that some people might have heard are, for example, Sieben Linden, uh, Twin Oaks Community, Pinhorn Community, Oroville, East Wind Community, Acorn, Angsbaka, Damanher, Madvase, The Farm, The Venus Project, Zeg, Earth Haven, Ganas, Arcosanti, Likatien, Sirius, Tamara, No Earth Nation, Christiania, Solbaka, Schloss Tempelhof, Blue Giants, etc., etc. If you want to, I could I could go by continent, because that's really what I've done as I've traveled around and mention a few of them, and we can go into detail about how some of them live and what are the, the ways and what makes them so unique. In That Europe, for example, uh, there's Sieben Linden in Germany, and they're they're pretty much they're one of the communities that I've been to that are really as close to self sufficiency as possible, and they're also pretty big in terms of using alternative forms of construction. 
And so that's that's one example. Another example is Finhorn in Scotland. Finhorn is quite well known because they have sprouted and created a foundation and created different organizations and they do a lot of the training of many people who are looking to build communities and eco-villages worldwide. Uh, they have about 450 inhabitants and it was founded by Peter and Eileen Caddy and Dorothy McLean. And they have a, quite an interesting story because they were guided to this area in Scotland where the soil was really sandy, was not fertile, they couldn't grow anything. So it was kind of a spiritual guidance. Funny enough, they stopped at a place and they didn't have many funds or resources and they asked to stay uh, near this hotel and where they asked for jobs so that they could make some money. And basically the hotel turned them down. Later on, they make enough money to buy the hotel and that's part of their history. Another thing that makes them particular is that Finhorn also has this particular way of doing agriculture where they really talk to the nature spirits and the elementals and they were able to grow food in areas, as I mentioned, that were not fertile at all, at all. And people thought they were crazy that they couldn't grow anything there. And some of their uh, produce, their vegetables, just grew to humongous sizes, even winning local awards. So that that's what makes them particular. Another uh, community is called Angsbaka in Sweden. And it's basically a course and festival center personal growth they're located in Vormland in Sweden and they've been around since the mid 19 uh, since the mid 1990s 1997 or so another example is Madvase a small Scandinavian community part of Arka Tentiris which is one of four communities part of the Federation of Damanhur which I also was part of in the Piemonte area of northern Italy uh, we were based on having uh, retreats and seminars and workshops and had our own garden and chickens uh, in a forest filled with uh, castañas, chestnuts, and lots of um, uh, lorble, laurel blade. I forget how to say it anymore. <laughs> but uh, also hazelnuts. Um, yes. Also then... Following up with Damanhur, Damanhur is, is one of the largest eco-villages in Europe. At a point in time, the population has been fluctuating, and at a point in time was about 800, and even higher. And with the lockdown, it decreased a bit, but now it's gaining back its numbers. Damanhur is a federation of communities in the area where it was founded in Piemonte area. There are four main communities. There is a large population of people from all over the world who has moved to be in the vicinity. But there is also Damanhur Norway, Damanhur Israel, Damanhur Japan, Damanhur Spain, Damanhur US, Damanhur Australia, uh, which talking about this, I was the co-founder of the Damanhurian South Australian chapter when I was living in Australia. So besides Damanhur, we have ZEC community, which is the Centrum für Experimentelle Gesellschaftsgestaltung, and they're pretty big on Gestalt therapy, on open forms of relationship on love and peace and they have a research center and out of ZEC uh, during different times few groups of people have gone and created other communities uh, which are still in existence one of them was Tamera in Portugal they have a ship called Kairos and they're pretty big on peace and conflict resolution and they have done an amazing job uh, regenerating the land where they are Another community is called Likatien, or the tribe, uh, and uh, they're in, in southern Germany. Moving up to the American continent, we have Twin Oaks, which was the first community, actually, that I've really got close to and visited and spent a lot of time with. Twin Oaks has been in existence for almost 60 years, if I'm not mistaken. Twin Oaks is very well established, and it started as a social experiment. Um, by a, psycholo a psychologist uh, called uh, Walden, and I enjoy my time there. They have huge gardens and a beautiful lake, and they created one of the first uh, tofu businesses. Back then, it was really tofu. Many people don't know what that was. That was just some crazy hippies who would consume tofu. And so because they were one of the first ones establishing it, their tofu business became a million-dollar industry. 
and they're still alive and thriving. One of the things that Twinox does, among other things, is the intentional communities gathering every year during the Labor Day weekend, which happens to be my birthday on the 1st of September. And I attended and collaborated and helped creating a few of these where I met many, many communities uh, worldwide. And um, yeah, so I have really fun memories of Twinox. Again, from Twinox, other communities have sprouted when many people came and there was long waiting lists. They actually helped uh, create a community not too far from them uh, near v Mineral Virginia called Acorn. So the Acorn doesn't fall too far too far from the from the oak. And uh, so Acorn is another community. So together with East Wind and Twin Oaks that are part of the FEC, which is the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. The Federation of Egalitarian Communities takes the whole concept of collaborating, cooperating and sharing to another level where all income, all revenue, all expenses are shared collectively and all decisions are made in a democratic way. At the time, it was all done on consensus. Most communities are, have been moving towards a sociocratic decision-making process. Um, Iswin, which I also lived in, uh, is located in the Osort Mountains in Missouri. Beautiful, beautiful land uh, surrounded by rivers. Uh, it's basically a reserve where a lot of wild animals, deer, fox, eagles are there. There are caves. There's also a lovely river that we used to go canoeing in. And it's when uh, one of the things that I also collaborated and supported was the development of a nut butter business. Nut butter meaning like almond butter or cashew butter or tahini or peanut butter, uh, which is really big in the U.S., yeah? And uh, that's one of their main businesses at the moment. Before, we used to also make hammocks like Twin Oaks, but the business started uh, decreasing with time. So most communities started diversifying their, their income. Uh, one of the most beautiful things about East Wind is just, just the land, the countryside, the fresh air, the wildlife. Um, it's a pretty free-spirited community. We had celebrations like the the first of May and we used to have a maypole and dance around and yeah, I had also really fun memories of, of East Wind. Uh, moving along, there is Earth Haven Eco Village in North Carolina. Uh, one of uh, the founders of um, sociocracy, she's, she's pretty big on teaching people about decision making processes. Uh, Diana Christian Leaf. Uh, lives there and a, a close friend of mine named Eugene Donaldson and they're also pretty big on permaculture they really had the the, the support and a great planning before they set up the, the eco village and it's one of the most well organized well prepared well structured communities and once it was created it really took off and there is Ghana's community in Staten Island New York City they were big in polyamory and they're famous because they had a huge shop, a uh, thrift and vintage shop, but they also had a book and a cafe and they had, you know, people coming kind of open mic, uh, doing presentations, doing performances. And it was kind of like a gathering center of really alternative people. We have the famous farm in Tennessee. I remember being there and learning a lot about how to, um, uh, grow mushrooms. I remember inoculating logs in the forest. And there was a big uh, movement at the time to train dolas. And they also had a huge extension of land. It was really wonderful. That's where I met Albert Bates. And uh, he was also key into the creation and development of the Global Eco Village Network, among others. Um, then when I was in Florida, I was living in the States. I also heard about this guy named Jack Fresco. I didn't know much about him. I started researching and he was like an engineer, psychologist, behavioralist, uh, inventor, writer, author, futuristic. And he had created this project called the Venus Project in a small little town north of Okeechobee Lake called Venus. And there, in I think it was like around 320 hectares of land, he actually built 
basically these models of how to create a better futuristic society here and now. And he covered everything from alternative forms of construction to the society and, econ and economics and everything really, agricultural, farming, uh, decision making, and he was so wise, so far ahead of his time. Unfortunately, he passed, but his partner, Roxanne Meadows, still there, following his footsteps and continuing with this beautiful project. I highly recommend to visit their website. In fact, the the documentaries, Zeitgeist, were created after his inspiration. Um, there you will be able to see lots of round shapes, uh, natural, earthy, feminine structures. He also got inspired from the Atlantean model of concentric circles and the water flowing and uh, using an advanced form of uh, beneficial and positive AI. Um, great guy. He really inspired me. At the time, I was really into pyramids and doing a lot of research to live inside a pyramid. Well, he totally turned me into domes and because they were efficient and the way that it heats up and they were so, soft and round and feminine. And that's where I learned to build domes, which we later on took some of this knowledge that he taught me and inspired me in a community that I co-founded in Ecuador near the Valley of Longevity, Vilcabamba. And so I'm so grateful of all I learned from him and also uh, Roxanne, which is still nowadays carrying on this beautiful dream. Uh, then there's another community, for example, Arcosanti, which put together different architectural models and ecology together. And I, I could continue. There's so many of them. I'll just mention a few, such as Sirius Community, Tamera we talked about, which is really a biotope and a model for peace. In Portugal, there is the famous Christiania from the 70s in Copenhagen in Denmark. If you haven't visited, if you ever go to Denmark, visit. You'll know what I mean. It's a beautiful, beautiful, lovely place. Then there is Arterra Bicimodu in northern Spain, in the Basque country. Um, then there is Valle de Sensaciones in Spain. Then in, in, in Finland, where I lived briefly too, and we're creating a community, we have Sobaka, we have Keuru, we have Tarquila, we have Livonsari, we have Gaijan, Lukomila. So all these lovely communities in the north. In Asia, we have the famous Oroville, which was uh, created in India, in the Tamil Nadu area by 1968, but a famous, uh, designed by a famous architect, Roger Anger, but it was created by Nero Alfasa. And it's based on diversity, peace, it's quite progressive, uh, experimental, they're into harmony, joy, uh, above all creeds, very secular, all politics. And the purpose is human unity. There is more than 3,000 people there from over 58, 58 different countries. Uh, we also have New Earth Nations by an acquaintance of mine, Sasha Stone, in Bali, in Indonesia. Quite lovely. Then in Africa, there are so many of them. And many of them you're not going to find listed in any of the directories and communities. We have, for example, Bafut Eco Village, which is an offshoot of 94 permaculture movement. And they have like design education uh, plans and programs. We also have Valhalla, uh, which is in Senegal. And it's really like a freedom cultural movement with a culture, natural buildings, sociocracy. Uh, they're a lot into solar panels and creating ways of providing safe water for many of the communities. And, you know, it goes on and on and on. But I think gives, this gives you an idea, right? Wow. <laughs> That is great. I think um, some of us get an idea where they might want to look if they are right now in a state of, I would like to live in an intentional community. So that is great. And it draws a whole different picture to what some people think about communities and, you know, the hippies and um, those who don't fit in into our society. How about all those myths about intentional communities? Right. So a lot of people have, have uh, different myths or ideas, unfortunately, because the media usually covers only the sensationalistic uh, negative, and they usually represent a small, a very, very small percentage of reality. 
uh, one other aspect of communities is that due to the consumeristic system that we live in, uh, communities are not really supporting a system of consuming, 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 because people are going to be sharing, sharing, sharing. So if there's 100 people living in a place, you don't need 100 cars, 100 fridges, 100, you know, uh, tools, 100 telescopes, and then people tend to share more, which in turn is even much more sustainable and better for the environment. And so that's why a lot of communities don't get a good rap. Um, can you think of any myths or ideas? What comes to mind before you heard of the concept community, Malena? Well, that's a good question. I, I'm not that familiar with all those um, myths. Um, I think at times it's like the hippies that they uh, misunderstand the, uh, the, the idea of love and like um, get together just for the fun of, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, it's some something like that. And then those um, folks who don't take good care of their bodies and are in a bad shape, something like that. Right, right, so, right. Totally. You're spot on. A lot of people who don't know much about communities, they think, oh, they're all cults, uh, that there is no communities in existence today, that this is something really modern only from the hippie movements, that they died out in the 60s and 70s, that they're all alike, that there is no privacy or autonomy, and you just all live piled up on top of each other, or that they're only for young people, or perhaps with senior communities, or it's only for old people, uh, that you have to be in the middle of nowhere to create a community, that you have to have a religion or a spiritual practice or a guru or a leader, <laughs> or that um, they're all really poor and they have limited resources, or that you don't have to work and there's no responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so those are usually some of the myths, which all completely wrong in my experience, anyhow. Wow. And so, yeah. <laughs> Great. Yes. So if all those myths are wrong, what what is it that you would say is, I mean, you already talked about some of the benefit that you share more and that you are able to live more sustainable what are other benefits that you, from your personal experience, can share? Right. So, yeah, let's talk about benefits and uh, also like, OK, well, fine. But why would I choose to live in one? I have everything I need. You know, I live in this you know, in the city or whatever, have my own house or with my own family. But I would say that some of the benefits of living in communally in an intentional community will be that, well, you're surrounded by people who, who share similar values and responsibilities. So you have a, like we talked earlier about, you know, some uh, communities that just spread out but don't have an intentionality. These ones, in turn, and opposite to the other ones, you actually do share similar values. And so there is that same share frequency. There is more compatibility. You get to know people better, so you can trust them. Something happens, you can easily ask for a car or someone to watch your your kids or a dog or a plant or when you go on holiday, there's so many things that make lives easier because these are people that you're actually a lot closer than in many cities when people don't even know their neighbors, you know? In Japan, recently, I was looking at this piece of news where people are dying of all age and nobody even knows that they have died. And so this sense of isolation where we are pushing the elderly and that everything is being compartmentalized and separated, in communities, another aspect, another positive aspect is that there's so much to learn, to teach, to share, because it's easy to find someone who plays the guitar or somebody who knows how to use the computer or somebody who knows uh, baking or a particular recipe, someone who's into gardening, uh, somebody who knows that, oh, yeah, tonight there is a falling stars mm -hmm. and we can set up the telescope and really out there. You don't know that many people who have all these skills, and if you do, they're far away, and you wouldn't be able to enjoy so many, so much knowledge in one location. Also, in addition, there's the social aspect, the companionship, connecting to people on a much deeper, intimate level, building relationships, and having the feeling of living really in a tribe, in an extended family. On the other hand, you also push each other for the better, right? Because not, not everything is, is fine and dandy. Not everything is, is, is pink color, right? Which I call really the mirroring process where you are constantly being faced to really who you are and not who you think you are. 
So for me, community living is really uh, a spiritual path because it, it it pushes you to face yourself and it allows for spiritual growth. But there's also more collaboration, more co-creation. You can easily find teammates for a project, a hobby. And in, in, in turn, you also have a healthier and higher standard of living because of the shared resources. And there's always something fun going on. I'll give you an example. I lived in this particular community, right? And let's say for simplicity of numbers, there were 100 of us. And all of us made, perhaps with the community businesses or working outside, 10,000 each, right? So at the end of the year, we had 1 million, right? Now, one person with 10,000 can hardly survive. That's way beyond the, the, the poverty level income, right? But when you have 100 people sharing a million, then we had so much abundance. Because like I said, we didn't need 100 cars and 100 fridges and 100 anything. So we were able to buy quality, you know, and share it among ourselves. So we had, say, seven really lovely quality cars. We had someone cooking. And who, the person who cooked was a person who was passionate, who loved cooking. So the people who didn't want to cook, didn't know how to cook, they enjoy beautiful cooked, loving meals. And if you two say 30 people out of the 100 love to cook, they only had to cook once a month, you know? If you di divided the the shifts, the cooking shifts, if you had one, one meal share among everybody, say you cook once a month, you know? So imagine how much more free time people had to do all the things. So that, that's, that's the beauty of community. If I wanted to learn to play the guitar, I wanted to know about carpentry, I always found someone who knows, a mechanic who was so happy to deal with the cars. And so those are some of the amazing aspects. You, you can also count on your community, on your tribe, on your family. You know each other. You are held responsible. And at the same time, you put your signature on whatever you're doing, whatever you're making, because everybody knows who did it. So you kind of really own it. And you lose that sense when you live in a city because you can become anonymous and nobody knows who you are. But in a community, everybody knows who you are. Uh, addition, in addition to this, it's also about the environment, resources, healing P Pachamama, reducing our carbon footprint, lowering our, our expenses. Um, it's great therapy. And you make friends for life. So th those are some of, of the positive, yeah? Wow, that sounds so great. But I'm sure there's also some downsides to it. I mean, some people enjoy being on their own and not um, in a community where they always face themselves, as you said, not the version of who they want to be, but really what their challenges are in life. What right. would you say are those things that we should keep in mind when we are thinking about moving or living in an in intentional community? Right. So, yeah, one of those aspects I just mentioned earlier about the mirroring process. But going further on that topic, um, you are faced daily with, with things and aspects of yourself that need growth, that you don't like, that are being mirrored by others. Uh, also, some people who, on one hand, everyone in the communities that I've been to have their own private space. So it's not like everybody lives together, but there has been some communes which share dorm spaces. But on the other hand, I also, as an example, I've met a few people who were kind of hermits, right? One thing I found that I, I, and I did ask them, if you're such a hermit and you're not so social, why do you live in a community? So one thing they did is that they got the night shifts, the night jobs. For example, if all the computers needed to be updated or the person wanted to do accounting or the person wanted to do a lot of cleaning of equipment, machinery, kitchens, or processing of food, they took those shifts. So they told me, yes, I'm kind of antisocial. I'm shy. I'm not, I don't really don't want to be around people, but I benefit even though, I mean, human beings are social beings, right? And even though I'm not that social, I still get the benefit that somebody's cooking and I can always find leftovers. That somebody's growing food for me organically. I know where the food is coming from. It's not being, you know, chemically or, or pesticides are being used. Um, if I need something, I can always find somebody who knows, who has that skills. And so there's that other level that no human is an island unto himself or herself and that we really do need other people. 
And so, so on, on one hand, these people were kind of hermits, but they still realized how much they could benefit from living in a community. And they found their space. They were able to build separate housing. Some people are a bit too sensitive. I've also found communities which are completely intolerant to chemicals. So they're like zero fragrance, which is great for people who have uh, chemical intolerances. And so that, that's another benefit. And they are able to accommodate by using only organic, biodegradable, earthy-friendly products and spaces in a community large enough for them to have their own house in far away. Also with people who more and more people nowadays are developing sensitivity to EMF and to Wi-Fi and all this kind of bomb bombardment of frequencies that are coming to us from so many places and are so harmful for our electromagnetic bodies and health and well-being. Um, yeah, I think those are some of the negative aspects that in general, yeah, you do get to see a lot of other people. There is more social aspects. It could be too noisy. Sometimes young people are making parties and, and being loud and, you know, drumming or playing music. And you have to be tolerant or like I have seen and suggested in, in some of my uh, community planning that the elderly are living in one area far away from the youth. Uh, then the young families with the kids and then another one for the teenage years. And so there are ways to actually address all these issues that could be challenging when they're not addressed. Um, again, communities are based on communication and you have to fine tune, you have to find solutions, you have to communicate, you have to express, you have to share, you have to be assertive in order for it to work. If you do not develop these tools, then you're going to have a hard time living in a community. Um, you must also be given, learn, and continuously explore the tools of uh, peaceful resolution. Many, some people call it conflict. I call it peaceful. So we focus on the peace aspect. So peaceful resolution. Um, and yeah, that level of knowing what you want, really, all in all, is really a journey of self-discovery, getting to know yourself, expressing yourself, finding solutions, communicating. And you can find solutions for all these challenges of what I would call some of the negative aspects of living with others. But at the same time, there are opportunities, opportunities for growth, opportunities for improvement, opportunities for self-betterment that can actually turn into something positive of living in communities. Wow, that is great. So let's say I'm all in and I want to go to that specific community. Mm. What is it that... Um, yeah, how or let's say I want to found a community. I want to gather people. How do I get started? Right. So the, the two parts of the question, how to go to one, we're going to list a few resources where people go out. There is uh, directories and there are maps and their online websites, including from the FIC, from the FEC, from Gen and others. And how to create one. One of the things I usually advise my clients and groups of people and even existing communities is like, don't start from zero because it's really a lot of work. And I mean, I'm not afraid of hard work and many people are not like uh, entrepreneurs and people who are kind of creating a new business because that's really very similar. And you have to have so much knowledge in different areas, right? But um, if people find a community that's close enough to their ideals, then I usually tell them, join them, give them a chance, right? If you are really, if you if you have failed and you don't find anything that's close to your ideals, which I mean, with so many communities out there, usually you can find, but perhaps due to geographical location, so you want it in a certain country or from a certain language, et cetera. Then I say, well, don't underestimate the task. It's really a lot of hard work ahead. It can be done. Be patient, takes time, a lot of preparation, a lot of tools, a lot of training, a lot of studying. Um, and I would say, well, first, get a group of people, your close friends, your buddies, the people you're compatible with. And I would suggest a number around five. Five for me is a very magical number. It's a good number. Because larger than five, when you have six, seven or more people, then it starts getting really difficult when you're trying to set up the structure and you start getting more discussions. It's going to take longer time. And less than five, you don't have enough diversity, knowledge, skills, etc. So I say five is kind of a good number, right? give or take. And then there's going to be a commitment to personal growth. And you have to have awareness of self-reflection, the ability to give and receive feedback. Um, do not underestimate the value of training, guidance, 
and, and hire the people who actually do have the knowledge because one thing is to read books. There is so much videos and information nowadays, but you know, one thing is to know it theoretically or in your mind, and another one actually to do it with the based experience. You know what I mean? With examples, with, with the wisdom that comes only after having been through it. And don't be afraid. Seek professional help, just like anything, you know? Uh, it's better when a professional guides you and does it than if you start on your own. And it's going to take you a lot much longer anyhow. And so one of the main principles of kind of put it into four main categories. I mean, it's longer, it's more, but for the terms of simplifying it, I would start with number one, the vision. So you must have clarity of vision, creating first your individual vision and moving through the values, the mission, the goals, the intention, right? And uh, after that, moving into a collective vision in the group and being able to share the things that once that you don't compromise, the ones that most have to, they have to be in there. And the ones that you say, okay, well, maybe yes, maybe not, so that you can actually come together with others. Because otherwise, you know, if you're not flexible, and uh, you're not going to be able to find others to do it. It cannot be just your way or the highway, right? So there's going to be some level of, of flexibility. Number two, after you have clarity of vision, both individually and collectively, you must quickly, you're going to be making decisions together. So you must embrace a decision-making process, right? So that you can make decisions together. And you can choose whatever you are. There are so many of them, you know, from consensus to phallocracy to, to authoritarianism to as well, or, or a hybrid, or perhaps uh, managers or leaders of groups or um, sociocracy, et cetera. After that, you must quickly look into ways of peaceful resolution, how to resolve conflicts, right? Because you're going to have differences of opinions, right? And one thing that I advise, work on your communication and what I call the rules of engagement. What is acceptable? How do you relate? How do you deal with each other? What is okay? What's not okay? So you minimize the triggering aspect and to remind each other all the time that you know, we're here because we share the same vision, the same mission, the same values, and always being open to revisit it and to get better and continue fine-tuning and improving. After that, a close third one will be finances, how to manage your economics, how to manage the funding, how to manage the short-term, the long-term, the investment, because money, as in many companies, is going to be a big issue. You have to be really practical earth you know grounded and realize okay what can we afford this is how we have it's like any business you know you create the business but you have to have some some capital for the first year do you start going it's the same with that community so you have to be really realistic about what's possible and what is not and then after that the fourth point will be to set up a clear and well thought out process for joining for membership and also for living which I call entry and exit strategy. Because let's face it, at the beginning, you have this beautiful, what I call honeymoon energy. You know, when you enter into a relationship and everything is perfect and beautiful and everybody's so excited and we're doing something together and everything is going to be wonderful. But sooner or later, there's going to be, because of whatever, life happens, right? There's emergency, something happened, perhaps a couple broke up, uh, perhaps something you don't agree any longer or somebody got pregnant and there's no space for children at the moment. Or, I mean, there are so many different circumstances that happen and somebody is going to end up leaving. So better have a clear exit strategy before you encounter the situation when everything is peaceful and loving and harmoniously than afterwards when things are perhaps not in the best mode. So those are so, my top four well, things to focus and concentrate when creating a community. But like I said, it's much more longer. And I do workshops, weekend workshops on each one of these points, and we can expand of them. And uh, happy to go more into detail, perhaps in, in another interview, if there is interest in the processes. Wow. Yeah. 
well, <laughs> that is a very clear plan and it shows how much effort it really takes to, I mean, it's just a sneak peek that we got here, <laughs> but I think it, it shows that it's not just coming together, celebrating, and then it all works out. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, everyone going in with, with lots of personal effort ready to put in. Yeah, that's great. So what would you say are the main reasons for failing? We always see communities growing, but we also see them failing. That's a very good point, Marlene Katarina. It's important to talk about why they fail, just like why businesses fail, so that we can learn from the mistakes and, and hopefully not, not make them or be fully aware and improve and get better and consider them before moving forward. So, like I said, just like in businesses out there, it's one of the main top reasons why intentional communities fail are because of finances, economics, not having enough money, and being overly ambitious and shooting for too much. Uh, a second close one I would say is that they lack the tools for and the methods for peaceful resolution. So if people are not trained and educated in many methods of dealing with with, with conflicts uh, or a way to communicate themselves properly, they will fail quickly. Um, also peaceful and democratic processes, listening skills, how to work with disagreements. And another big one will be transparency. Yeah, in communities sooner or later, even small communities in cities or villages, everybody knows everything. So better to be transparent about it, especially in two points, right? One, sex, and the other one, money, because they're usually associated with power. And I've learned that in communities, you must be fully transparent, especially with those two points, but with everything else. Another point I highly advise is to have regular check-ins and check-outs. You know, beginning of the day, how are you? How did you sleep? How are you feeling? What's going on? Um, for example, you know, you're working together today in the garden and, you know, you're feeling really sick, but you haven't said anything. And I'll be like, man, you know, Malene is so slow today. What's wrong with her? She doesn't want to, you know, Help me with the potatoes. and But if we would have had a check-in and you tell me, Leah, you know what? I woke up today with a cold. My throat is hurting, but I know it's important to cover the potatoes today. Let's go do it. I'll be more more tolerant towards you. So, well, yeah, wow, she's sick yet. She's here with me. So that completely shifts and changes the dynamics. And so extrapolate this to all kinds of dealings throughout the day in so many different situations. Situations, so it's very important to know where are people at today. You know what's going on. Oh, maybe, oh, my dad is sick, or you know somebody died in the family. Then you're a bit more tolerant, more flexible, and and you understand why things are happening. And of course, the check out at the end of the day. How was it for you today? What, was there something that didn't work out? What worked? What didn't? Did I say something? Did you say something? If there is any misunderstanding, better to clear it. You have the opportunity. To clear it today because otherwise you start putting oh it wasn't that big it wasn't a big deal of a thing and you put it in a bag and more and more and you start carrying this heavy bag with all those resentment and misunderstandings and you know assumptions and the bag gets heavier and heavier and heavier and it's better to start from zero every day with a light bag with no bag at all you know and, and communicate, get to know each other better. That's how you create the, the deeper intimacy that builds the sense of an extended family, a tribe. Another one will be, I'd say besides these points, will be check on your growth, check on gender imbalance, check on attracting and keeping young people because many communities didn't worry about that at the beginning and then they start getting older and older and the older they get, the harder it is to understand young people intergenerational uh, and the less the young people want to join them etc cetera, etc cetera. another one i'd say will be flexibility and adaptation and to close the group i'd say to avoid what's called as the founders syndrome so th those will be my top key points on what to avoid or what makes communities fail the founders um, syndrome, you you call it. Can you can you explore about that? Can you tell us more about that? What do you mean by that? Sure, sure, sure. And like I said, you know, I can go in detail about all of them, but all of this takes a lot of time, and I think soon we'll be running out of time. But so the founders syndrome, quickly, it's as the name says it. Founders 
usually found the community and then they usually tend to have more power because they are the founders, you know, they put in so much effort, work, energy, finances, economics. And then many people will be in the end afraid to say something against them, even where they're no longer right or or say something that, that goes against their principles or ideals. When in, in fact, communities after a few years, they need to evolve and there is new energy coming in and new ideas and new goals and they cannot stay fixed. Another thing associated with the founder syndrome is that it doesn't have to be specifically or only a founder, but it could be someone who joined in at the beginning or someone who perhaps invested a lot of money or someone who's respected or who has a title or who could be a politician or had this big position, etc. And people tend to still uh, use this as an excuse to treat them differently or give them more power than they deserve because communities... I think in general are also about creating equality. Everybody has an equal vote and we're doing this together and cooperating and collaborating and no one should be above anyone else. Of course, there is respect for the elders. And of course that there is, you know, I take my hat off for those people who are founders of community as myself and I'm grateful, but in the end we must create equality. And especially when founders would abuse this as it happens with some communities. He goes all up to the head, especially if they're not grounded or develop a big ego. And so there's got to be a system of checking in this. Yeah. So I think all of us have learned a lot, not just about intentional communities, but actually about our lives. <laughs> like we can take lots of those things you have just shared and shared with us into our current life and make it a better experience for each one us as well as those people living close to us or those we meet in on a daily basis so thank you for all of that maybe we could um, conclude with your personal experience i mean you have that rich experience in living in communities what would you like to share what you have learned in your communal experiences yeah living in community has taught me about di diversity flexibility openness i've learned so much also I my mean, mind body and spirit knowledge um uh, also it has brought me closer to nature caring for the environment self-sufficiency resiliency uh you know living in cities and having had jobs in the corporate world you know Uh, certain appearances, dressing in a certain way, uh, brands, jewelry, the use of chemicals, which I thought were common and normal, uh, which can be having a detrimental effect on people who are having reactions to them, uh, reusing, repairing, refusing, reducing, recycle, you know, zero waste. Um, all in all, I've learned that sharing really is caring. That is good for, for the environment, it's good for me, it's good for Pachamama, and that caring is love, love and happiness. Uh, that's what I've learned. You find your tribe, you find your family. I've learned that what I have control is only about myself and my surroundings, and I've learned that by joining others with similar values, the inner divine light shines bigger, that together we can live by example, we With growth, sharing, learning, mirroring, service, intimacy, and a deeper knowing of others that ultimately leads to a deeper knowing of myself. I, le I learned that by improving myself, I can be and become the change I want to see in the world. And uh, I encourage everyone to build a community where you are and that create a better world starting with you and then with your tribe. So that's my message. And uh, right now, I would like to open the floor. If there are any Q&As, any questions and answers, we can move on to them. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have 4% battery right now. I have to go inside and charge. Okay, okay, perfect. So I think my final question for today, I mean, we will have an entire session for all those watching now or later where you can come and um, we, we will come together actually in a webinar or some kind of virtual gathering and you can ask your questions directly to Ashwa Rainbow Dragon. So for now, just um, a last final question from my side. And that would be, we 
and especially me, are always talking about universal peace and cosmic harmony. How can we tune into that already existing harmony that we j don't have to to effort into? We mm -hmm. we can just release and uh, allow that harmony. So, what would you say? It sounds a lot like effort for me <laughs> when you speak about those intentional communities. Mm -hmm. What's um, the relationship with cosmic harmony and universal mm -hmm. peace and mm -hmm. intentional communities? Right. So uh, as I was talking a bit earlier, uh, I think that for me, community living, it's kind of like a spiritual journey uh, through the mirroring process because I really get to see aspects of myself that I wouldn't otherwise, because I, I have a constant reminder through the people I see around me. Or for example, I'll give you a specific example. I say, you know, I'm extremely punctual. And then somebody will say, no, that's not true. You were five minutes late for the meeting and you were 10 minutes late the other time. And you told me we we're going to have dinner at four and you showed up at four fifteen, And then you realize, or oh, maybe I think I'm punctual, but I'm not really that punctual. And so you get immediate feedback, you know what I mean? But also also in terms of when perhaps there is something about someone that you don't like, really, it all points back to yourself. Why am I feeling uncomfortable? Why am I feeling that way towards that other person? What shadow, what aspect of myself is there that I need to see? Why is it that person triggering me? Why do I feel this way about another person? So all of these different sensations, feelings, triggers, to me points to a journey of self-discovery. And when I get to know myself better, I develop by living together with other people, tolerance, love, people in diverse settings with diverse people, religions, cultural beliefs, spiritualities, way of cooking, way of cleaning, way of seeing things, way of folding the clothes, way of playing music, so many different ways. And to me, all of these points to our inner harmony, harmony with others, and also the environmental aspect of harmony with the animals, with nature, with the trees, with the forest, with our carbon footprint, with sharing, with cooperating, with collaborating um, in so many ways by, by helping the elderly, by helping young people, by helping others in need, by getting truly more deeper, intimate with each other. All of this, to me, points to a, towards a, a peaceful, cosmic harmony in ourselves, with those who live around us, with the planet, with the environment, and then you can take it all the way to the cosmos. Wow. <laughs> okay, that is fantastic. I thank you so, so very much mm -hmm. for this rich and very, very insightful conversation we had today. Thank you for all that you are and for all that you represent as well and for walking your talk. I want to get into that later on. We will have a series of conversations about the community. You are at the current moment founding <laughs> together with two other people. And um, yeah, do, do you want to give us a sneak peek or do we want to keep that for the next time? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I uh, just uh, came from living for almost a couple of years in a German community called Schloss Tempelhof between Stuttgart and Augsburg. And um, before that, I was living in Damanhur. And so I was guided to come to Italy. So I'm at the moment in the lovely, magical, sunny and warm island of Sardinia, which is in a blue zone. And at the moment, I am co-creating an intentional community called Blue Giants. So I can share that with you. Okay. So, yeah, let's stay tuned for more about the Blue Giants. And also, if you, as someone who has watched it and tuned into this, feel that you would like to ask some questions, make sure that you go to the website that is below this video and just put in your name into our news, Universal Peace and Cosmic Harmony News, so we can stay in touch and tell you when this meeting will be. 
Yes, for now, that is all from my side. I am extremely grateful and I'm sure this will answer a lot of questions and also bring up some questions for one or the other. Thank you and speak to you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Marlene and Katarina. And I wanted to give thanks to all the elementals, to all the nature spirits, the kingdoms, our lineages, our ancestors, the land we're in, and all the light beings who are accompanying us in our journey. Thank you for your time, for this lovely interview, and until the next time, content.